I wanted to implement coin joins and they didn't understand coin joins as well as I did. So I was like, well, if I'm going to teach that, let's teach everyone. So here we are. But uh, I didn't forget any slides. I'm just going to whiteboard the whole time. Hopefully, uh, try to make it interactive as possible. I want you guys to like, hopefully by the end of this, like we'll all invent coin joins and like zero link together. But we'll see. Um, like all things in Bitcoin, this was invented by Greg Maxwell back in 2013. Um, him and Taj just keeping everyone employed. So thanks to those guys. But um, basically, this is an attempt to help solve or fix some parts of Bitcoin privacy. So even before we talk about coin joins, we're going to talk about privacy on Bitcoin. So I guess super quick overview. Bitcoin has transactions. And there's mainly two parts. There's inputs and outputs. And the inputs are from like, they're from uh, unspent transaction outputs, so just from previous transactions. And they have outputs of where the money goes. And most, here actually, most transactions look like this. There's just two inputs and two outputs normally. And this is like both of Alice's inputs. And then Alice is paying Bob, so she'll send like one payment to him, and then she'll have a uh, a change output. And normally this is like extremely obvious what's going on. This will be like either like a million sets. So you're like, okay, it's a round number amount. That's obviously a payment. Or it'll be like a round dollar amount where it's like, you know, it's just $75. And it's like, okay, well, that was probably a payment of $75. This is like just an aggregate amount of those two. Um, so normally payments are pretty easy to tell on chain. And um, coin joins don't really try to solve the problem of payments. They're trying to solve the problem of basically like this, where you see like these are Alice's coins. And um, to get started like, on that part, it's like, you know, these are just like, you know, random addresses that we can't really see, like, you know, it doesn't have Alice, it's not like BC1 Alice or something, it's, you know, a huge random address. But Alice got these coins from somewhere, likely like somewhere like Coinbase or something like that. And, you know, when she's withdrawing from Coinbase every time, you know, she has like evil government sending her coins to her wallet. And she's got all these coins that are associated with her. So when she spends them, they know like, okay, this is Alice spending this money. And you know, obviously that's not good. And uh, the way to get around this is basically like, we wanna basically break this link here where you know, she's getting this money, like if you're buying off like Coinbase or something, like coin joins aren't gonna help save you totally. Like Coinbase, Coinbase still knows you bought this Bitcoin, but we don't want them to know where we're spending it. So if I wanna, you know, go on a dark net market and buy drugs, you know, don't advise it. But uh, yeah, if you wanna do that, you know, they're gonna know you did that unless you do, you know, you break this link here. Or if you just, you know, wanna make a payment to a friend without them knowing anything like that to preserve your privacy, we need to break this link here. So how do we do that? Um, so there's lots of techniques, but basically like we want to make our coins look like someone else's or just hard to see where my coins went. Um, so problem is though, if we just said like, okay, if we take that original transaction where we had, um, Alice paying Bob, let's have two payments in a transaction. So we'll have four outputs and four inputs. So if Alice is making a payment to Bob and Carol is making a payment to Dave. So we have these two payments here. So most likely, again, these are going to be like normal output amounts. So it's going to be like, you know, say this one's a million sets and this one's $75. But now it's pretty obvious, like looking at it, okay, these are the payments, these are the outputs, and then these are the change outputs. 
And even if these were in random order, we can um, add up these two, and add up these two, and like you know, kind of figure out like, okay, if these are the payments, then if these two. Oh, I put this wrong. Um, So if these two are the payments, then these two must be the change outputs. We need to figure out who owns the inputs and then which is their change output. And normally just by you know adding them up and like figuring out, okay, like Alice isn't gonna pay, like, you know, if this was one Bitcoin, this was two Bitcoin, this was like half a Bitcoin, and this was like four Bitcoin. So I guess let's make these round Bitcoin amounts to make it better. So this is, let's say, two Bitcoin, and this is three. So then her change output would be half a Bitcoin, and this change output would be one Bitcoin. So we can easily see, like, you know, okay, there's four and a half Bitcoin here, and someone got half a Bitcoin, and this person has three Bitcoin, and there's a one Bitcoin output. Like, it's pretty obvious, like, um, you can create easily mental models to kind of like delineate these and be like, okay, this is this person's inputs and, or output, and this is this person's output. So you don't really solve the problem. You basically need a way to make these look the same. So payments and coin joins are kind of a really hard problem, um, and there are ways around it. But like normally, just like merging transactions is, you know, it's it's slightly better. We need like you know, it's not as obvious as the first case. It doesn't totally solve the problem. So we're going to introduce coin joins. Um, I guess let's keep my box. So instead, we're going to basically try to, instead of like making payments, we're going to just make payments to ourselves. So the idea here, or does it, if we first went over, does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone about how you know, we can still see what's going on? Right, I see nodding. Um, so now instead of that, we want to, instead of like trying to like hide our payment, let's just try to hide our Bitcoin and say like, instead of saying you can't find my payment, we're just saying you can't find my coins before my payment, which makes it easier. Um, so now we have, we have this, uh, you know, Alice has three Bitcoin, Carol has four and a half Bitcoin, and they want to make it look like you know, I don't know who owns which between Alice and Carol at the end. So basically, the way to do this, like you know, if I saw in the last one, we uh, we we were able to tell it by summing and seeing the different amounts. So basically, the way to fix that is just use the same amount everywhere. So what we have three, seven, seven and a half Bitcoin here. So if we had one, two, three, four, five, six. We're gonna have a bunch of outputs. Well, let's make these here. So we're gonna have, let's say, a two Bitcoin coin join round. So Carol's gonna get, if we're doing a two Bitcoin coin join round, Carol's gonna get two sets for this one. So she'll get Carol and Carol. And then Alice will get one. And then they both need their change output, so Alice will get a one Bitcoin output, and Carol will get her half Bitcoin back, and then there'll be like a coin join coordinator fee here. And um, basically what this is solving now is like, these coins are still screwed over. Like, you know, you can see that like, this probably came from Alice. I mean, you wouldn't put in an extra output like this, but you know, we'll, we did like 1.5 and 0.5 or something, then she can have an extra one. Either way, um, you're able to tell, like, these are still easy to tell because you do that you know, output sub analysis stuff and figure out, like, who owns what. But we did solve these coins where now when they come back, they say, okay, we can tell whose change outputs they are, but I know, I don't know if this is Alice's coin or this is Carol's coin, like, whose is which. So that's, like, the fundamental thing that coin joins are trying to do is basically hide among these things. This is, like, you know, you can write this on a whiteboard and you can make stupid, stupid, simple software to construct these transactions. Then the hard part now is like creating these in an anonymous way. Um, but before we even get into that, does this part make sense? I, see, I still see some nodding. I guess we can over, go over um, 
Wabi Sabi as well. So this is like this is the way coin joins have existed for the last like decade basically um, of just uh, using the same amount numbers. What Wasabi came out with recently, I um, mean, I don't advise their wallet, but the research they did is really cool. Basically, they're, they're using something called hamming weights for the amounts instead. So instead of just having one round being like two Bitcoin for everyone, they try to compose the numbers into like a bunch of small numbers that can add up to anything. So um, think of like, you know, dollar bills. You know, what your dollar bills aren't like 339. Your dollar bills are like, you know, 1, 2, 5, 10, 20. And with these numbers, you can easily build any other number you want. And uh, we can do the same thing in Bitcoin. Um, so instead, we have a transaction that's, um, I guess let's put some numbers here. So if we have Alice at one Bitcoin, Carol at two Bitcoin, and Bob at three Bitcoin, instead of we could give everyone like a one Bitcoin output here. It would be, it would work pretty well here. But I guess let's do like, uh, let's do like point ones with everyone. So it's a little harder. Um, so in that case, like, well, instead of like breaking up into all these, um, you know, just huge outputs that like, you know, if I want to go spend $10, now I have to like show a one Bitcoin output. We can compose these into much smaller things. So we could do like, you know, Alice gets a 0 0.05, Bob gets a 0 0.05, and then let's say like Carol gets a 0 0.1, and another 0 0.1, and you basically just like do this kind of like at infinitum, and you get like all these little outputs that are much more composable, and uh, you're able to like actually make smaller like payments and not have this like, what this is like really solving is like, okay, well, now we can have all these different amounts, but now we don't have these huge change outputs that um, end up being toxic. So that's what the other kind of way to solve this is using like these smaller amounts. Now the, uh, and again, in theory it's simple in the create, creating the coordinator process to do this is super complicated, but um, We'll get into that later. But this, like, you know, high over low view, like what coin joins are trying to solve. Does that make sense to everyone? Topher. Two questions. Um, so, in this method, does that mean that all of the participants have to provide the required input to use in order to construct the correct size output? Um, it's not an exact number, but I'm not sure if it has Yeah, so. In that, in that first case where it's like everyone's getting the same output amount, basically, yeah, like the coin, the coin join rounds, like this is a one Bitcoin round and everyone just registers like, you know, 1.1 to pay the fee and do the thing. With this, it's more like client side where Alice comes with any amount of Bitcoin and then comes with any amount of outputs. Um, so, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, she needs to make sure like, okay, all of my outputs are there and my, my inputs are adding up correctly and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm a little bit maybe when it comes to this, I have a concerning question, and that is, um, do you, is a coin join like existing for, like, can you use a coin join because multiple people need to obfuscate and anonymize their transactions, or can only one person do it, like with the Alice to herself? Um, no, so. Like with all things in privacy, you, you can't just hide among yourself, you need to hide amongst the crowd. So you want basically, like Alice wants to look like Carol and Bob, and Carol wants to look like Alice and Bob, and you know, they all want to look like each other. So yeah, when, it, when you're doing a coin join transaction, everyone should be getting privacy from it. And you know, that's the goal of like, you know, Alice may have like, they, like this may be coming from like a thousand coin joins before, this may be like, you know, a coin that was just bought on Coinbase. But at the end of it, they should all have, you know, slightly more privacy. And, um, you know, it, it's incremental and it's not totally easy to uh, quantify, but that's the end goal. Yeah. Well, my concern is a little higher level of the huge function of most of the big one was not doing it for every level. Mm -hmm. You saw what happened with Ethereum with Whirlpool and the developer, and it was in Europe. 
Yeah. Is FinCEN and all these regulatory agencies going to clamp down on CoinJoin? What's the word in the development community? Yeah, so I mean, the thing is, this is a lot harder to stop. Um, for one, like, you know, uh, with Tornado Cash, like, the way Ethereum works is just like a contract has an address. So basically, like, the address is just like 0x, blah, blah, blah. And they basically just said, you're not allowed to send to this address anymore. So that's like kind of easy to stop. Like, you know, exchanges just blacklist that address. All these other like apps just blacklist the address. And now, you know, Tornado Cast is sanctioned. Versus in coin joins in Bitcoin, you're not just like sending to like one fixed address. You know, you're creating like this, you're creating a, a transaction that just has many inputs and many outputs that look alike. So like, you know, that's a little harder to ban, like. You know, Coin can't, Coinbase can't just say like, you can't send us an address. That they could, they'd have to say like, no transactions with you know 50 equal inputs and outputs. They'll say, okay, well then we'll do 49, and you can fuck off. So, um, you know, it's you know it's not a total solution because you know then they just say you know they lower the number to like two, but uh, it's harder. It's just harder to stop. Uh, we have seen it already in the world though, where like. I remember like BlockFi was blocking, Binance maybe too, were like blocking, or like people would deposit coins that looked like they came from coin joins and they'd be like, please prove where you got this and or like, you know, further KYC. So it has happened, but uh, I mean, hopefully we just make this the norm. And as well, like things like Lightning, um, you know, like I guess Coinbase and Binance don't support Lightning, but a lot of exchanges do nowadays. And like Lightning is able to like give you a lot of privacy benefits that uh, CoinJoin can as well. So, like, you know, if they're able to support Lightning, like, they should support CoinJoins. Like, you know, at the company I work at today, the Bitcoin company, like, our compliance officer, um, like, he didn't understand Lightning. And I was like, oh, he's like, where does the money come from? I'm like, I don't know. It's just, this is how Lightning works. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> and he was like, oh, God, like, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's just the nature of how, like, you know, we, we built these systems of you, you know, as private as we, we can be, as we're trying to get there. And um, so I don't know, like, it's gonna it's gonna be a battle. But I think, like, luckily in the way this is structured, it's not just like you know block this address like they did with uh, Tornado Cash. It's you know it's gonna have to be like a heuristic kind of thing, which you know, um, there's actually a lot of uh, cool research being going on. Um, Waxwing. Uh, or Adam Gibson gave a talk at Bitcoin Plus Plus about a concept called CoinJoin XT, where basically you're you're doing this, but instead of having it one transaction, deliver like many transactions that look like normal payments. So then it um, basically like you're still doing the same structure, getting the same exact like benefits, but you don't have the on-chain footprint of it. It just looks like payments. So then it's even harder to tell what's going on. Um, maybe we can get into that at the end, but I don't fully understand it. But it's you know, there's this, all, a lot of this can be improved. Yeah, Topher. Uh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering, like, the, there's obviously a lot of privacy tools in Bitcoin, but CoinJoin, the main use case for people is trying to break that link. Like you were saying, like, they screwed up in the past, they know that their UTXOs, maybe their entire wallet publishes like docs. Um, is CoinJoin just like basically a hundred times better than any other method for breaking that link? Because I know there's like PayJoin. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I guess like, so CoinJoin, yeah, is like basically, it's trying to like hide your pre, like what you previously did. And then like the people who sent to you, they, they don't, you're so like, like this is your CoinJoin. So the people like that from back here will be like, okay, like it stops here. I don't know what happened to coin join. And then the people that you make payments in the future, when they're looking back, um, they're like, what? I don't know what, where it came from, but it came from this coin join. That's all it. So basically you're just like, kind of just like creating a wall of like the past and future of like what's happening. So that's kind of the goal there. Um, yeah, so there are things like pay join is more I mean, it does a little bit like CoinJoin, but normally the, the main benefit of PayJoin is to actually hide the payment amount. Um, uh, what else is there? There's like CoinSwap as well, where basically you're like swapping coins with someone else. You're almost just trading histories, not like blocking like 
to be able to see the history. Um, you could do like things in Lightning as well. It kind of ends up being like similar to coin swaps. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, we can maybe get into page ones at the end. Those are kind of cool too. Yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah, it's like a two-person coin join, but instead of like doing this equal amount stuff, you're basically. Um, I guess I could do that real quick. It's it's page joins are awesome. Um, so let's say Alice is paying Bob, and so before we, ha I'll see like that original transaction I did. Oh wait, yeah. So we had originally we had Alice. I mean, let's say it was half a Bitcoin and um, she gets one back and Bob gets 0.9. So this is like a payment to Bob and, you know, we can, if, you know, if we know this is Alice and this is like, okay, this is Bob's payment. And we saw that Alice paid Bob 0.9 Bitcoin. And you know, that's not the best. Like we're able to figure out the actual payment amount. And uh, like I talked about before, if it's like a round number or like a round dollar amount, it's kind of obvious that that's the payment amount. So we can actually hide this. Where if Bob helps construct the transaction, he comes in with say like you know another 0.5 Bitcoin. Yes, these don't need to be round, so let's let's make it one. So if he comes with 0.1 then he can just add his own money back into the amount he receives. So now it looks like, um, you know, now we don't know if this is um, the actual payment amount. It's because, um, you know, his, the payment was 0.9, but the output on here is one. So now it's like uh, a naive actor, you know, someone doesn't know about penny join would think, oh, this is a one Bitcoin payment, but it was actually a 0.9. And um, and then we're also breaking this common input heuristic of you know there's multiple people's inputs in the same transaction, so that's kind of what pay joins do. They are like little coin joins, but um, normally the goal is to hide this payment amount here, not really to. Uh, I mean, it kind of obfuscates like your history, but normally it's to hide this amount. Is it like hard to coordinate these transactions? Could you imagine like if every wallet over time starts to default to pay joins and like. Everyone would gain a ton of anonymity. Yeah, I mean, like, they are, but they shouldn't be. Like, Lightning requires way more coordination than a pay join, and Lightning works very well, or pretty well. So, um, you know, I think it's, yeah, just more like wallets need support. Like, a lot of problems come in from, like, oh, I don't want to give the person I'm paying my IP address, so I, I need a Tor connection, and then, you know, my wallet doesn't support Tor, but things like Nostr can kind of fix that, too, and other ideas. Yeah. yeah they're, they're relatively easy. Yeah. 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 The BIP is really simple. It's just like, here's a PSBT. Here's another PSBT. Sign, broadcast. Like, very simple. Um, but yeah. So. Back to coin joins. So like, I mean, I guess on the same topic, like this was easy to coordinate because there's just two people involved. We just talked to each other. We're doing a payment anyways. Um, but what if we have, you know, everyone in this room trying to construct a transaction and we're not all in this room. How do we, how do we, you know, come together and do this? Um, and then how do we do it anonymously? So it's like one major problem. Like, you know, we could just like all post it to a website and then the website sends us a transaction back and then we sign it and we're good. Problem is, you know, when I say like, here's my inputs, here's my outputs, this website's run by the CIA. They know, okay, here's Ben's inputs and here's Ben's outputs and the coin join is useless. So we wanna be able to say, here's my inputs, here's my outputs without being the same person and a big problem with that is being able to sit, like, you know, not have, like, I, I say, here's my inputs, and then Austin runs in and says, I'm Ben, here's my outputs. Like, you know, how do I, how do you, how do you authenticate me without knowing that it's me? 
And um, I guess we'll go over that because I don't think you guys are going to invent blind signatures. But yeah, so the, the idea of the way you do this is called blind signatures. Um, so these, um, these are cool. They're very complicated in their implementation. Luckily, we don't have to do that. But um, in theory, they're pretty simple. Uh, they work with Schnorr and like RSA, some other stuff. But um, these never go on chain or anything. They're almost always just like an off-chain like coordination mechanism, not something that like you know is going to be in your Bitcoin transaction. It's purely for like authentication. Um, there are other ways to do authentication as well besides blind signatures, but this is the one I know best. We're going to do that one. Um, so a blind signature is basically just like we have. Um, how do I explain? So we have like Alice. Alice has a. Um, she has a message, and she wants Bob to sign it. So. Um, but she doesn't want Bob to know the message that he's signing. She just wants to say, Bob, here's this encrypted thing. Please sign it. And then when she comes back later, she wants to have Bob's signature. And when she gives it to Bob, he wants to be able to, she, or she wants him to be able to say, okay, yes, that's my signature. It's valid. But she, and she wants him to be able to then authenticate the message, but not link it back to that first request of saying, please sign this encrypted thing. So, um, I mean, there's some fancy math in here, but basically like she, she's basically able to like, kind of like blind this message and then give it to him. And then he signs the blinded message. Um, and he has this blinded signature. And when he gives it back, Alice can use the, basically the method she used to blind this message to unblind the signature. And then she'll have Bob's signature that he will recognize, but not know that it's this blind signature that he messaged. Um, so this is important for like that, like I said, when it, for authentication. So like the way you do this in coin joins is instead of this message just being like, hello, it's, this is normally like, like this is an address. So you basically normally like what you're doing is saying like, here's my address and you give it to Bob and he will sign it. But he doesn't know what address he just signed. He just knows Alice gave me something and I signed it. And then when he comes back um, and he gives a signature, he's like, oh, okay, this is the address, you know, BC1Q, blah, blah, blah. But he doesn't know that this is the one that Alice gave him. He just knows this is one of the addresses he signed. So you're able to like kind of anonymously authenticate like an address without um, linking it to to Alice. Does that make sense? Why would Bob sign it? Like, what's the incentive for him? I mean, so this is just like like in this case, like Bob will be like the transaction coordinator of like constructing the transaction. So like you know, he's not like signing a transaction that's like spending money at this address. He's just like this is an all off chain thing of just like. I want people to register coin jo or inputs and outputs in my coin join. So this is how we authenticate that users aren't cheating me. So there's one Bob, but potentially hundreds of Alice's. Yes. Everyone got that, how this works? Is there any way to make sure there's a variety of people who can do that? Like what if the round is 1,000 and Alice just sends 1,000? Yeah, so I mean, we'll get into like, normally you sol you'll solve that with fees and economics. Um, we'll get into that a little bit, but normally like basically, like uh, normally people complain about coordinator fees, but actually very important for coin joins because, you know, if Alice just registers a thousand inputs, well now she'd have to pay like, you know, a thousand X fees. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, she could civil attack it, but it gets, you know, very expensive. So hopefully they run out of money before the end of time. But uh, yeah. Any more questions? We can start with yeah. Is there a way of, I guess, creating an incentive without fees? Like that kind of makes coin joins expensive for people to make. Um. Maybe it's hard. Like civil attacks are hard. Um, you know, normally. You, 
the ways are either just like pay fees so it gets very expensive or like KYC, which obviously would not work here. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it would be hard, in, especially like in a transaction construction uh, scenario. You, I guess, um, so one thing that actually that uh, Join Market does is something called Fidelity Bonds, where, because they don't have this coordinator process, they, it's more P2P, and basically what they do is um, instead of, like, or you still pay fees, but basically the, when you're picking someone to do a coin join with, instead of, you know, you just, it's just a list of like random peers, so you can't really like authenticate who's good and who's not. So the way they, see, the way they do it is, they have people lock up Bitcoin for a long period of time. So if someone locks up 10 Bitcoin for three years, you're like, okay, this guy means business. You know, that's uh, it's a lot of money locked up. Versus if this guy has, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin locked up for two months, he's, not, you know, he's, you know, less uh, trusted or like, you know, less skin in the game. And then as well, the way they do it is um, the amount of Bitcoin and time you locked up is like squared to the amount of value that is like given. So if I lock up 10 Bitcoin, um, that's like worth 100 points versus if one guy locks up or one guy like looks like locks up one Bitcoin 10 times, that's only worth 10 points because those are all individual things. So civil attacking gets harder there. Um, you know, it kind of sucks a little bit because you have these huge time constraints and liquidity lockups, but um, and I know it's working like really well. I mean, in the first week when Join Market launched it, like 50 Bitcoin was locked up. And I don't know the current stats, but there's a lot of Bitcoin locked up. So um, that does help. Yeah, yeah. So uh, good question. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like if you are paying these coordinator fees, like, well, what if the, the bad guy is the coordinator and he's not, then he's, you know, he's paying himself. So um, something I've talked about is like, well, it'd be great if like coordinators, like instead of like taking the fee, the fee, like, or at least half of it or something, went to someone like HRF or OpenSats or Brink, these like, you know, Bitcoin charities. So then, you know, at least like a portion of the fees isn't going back to the coordinators. So they have to like end up, uh, Losing money if that's still a problem. Um, and no one does that yet, but you know, one day we will. Um, but yeah. All right. Should we invent coin joins now? All righty. So. Okay. So. Now we need to create a way to create these transactions. So again, um, transactions have like two main parts. Um, I guess we'll just have this big box this whole here this whole time. So we have these Alice's. Alice one, Alice two, all these people. And they have Bitcoin. And they just want to freaking coin join it. And there's a coordinator over here who's like, let's make a transaction. So uh, the naive way, like I said, it would just be like, here's my inputs, here's my outputs, they construct a transaction, and uh, the coordinator knows everything. So let's, uh, well, let's not do that, because that's that won't work. Um, so basically, we're going to use these blind signatures to kind of solve that. So instead, um, Alice is going to, these Alice's are going to post their inputs with, to, to the coordinator. Um, so here, let's make a message. Uh, so we're going to give her our inputs. And um, we also want to give that blind signature, like that blinded message of the output that we want to register. So we have this like blinded output. 
So we have this, uh, we have our inputs of like, you know, the money that we're spending, this blinded output of like, you know, this is where I want the money to go, but it's blinded so the coordinator doesn't know that's associated with my inputs. And um, I guess we can also give, yeah, then we need to change address. And my change goes here. That doesn't need to be blinded because um, non-sophisticated actor could figure that out, um, which is, I talked about at the beginning, the output sum analysis. So basically, Alice, all these Alice's are going to send these messages to the coordinator. Um, does that make sense? I'm seeing nods. So then, they come back. Alice's, or uh, the coordinator. So like once all these Alice's are registered and the like coin join's good to go, this coordinator is going to um, she has, so she has all these messages with, um, but most importantly, she has like all these uh, these blinded signatures. So like once everyone's registered, she'll like sign all those um, blind signatures and send them back here. So Alice will have. Oh, I can't. Now Alice will have these blind signatures. I guess. Let's make like a, a model of this. So we have so we have right now their inputs are registered, and these are like blind. So we have these these inputs registered here. The coordinator knows that, and but we just have these blinded outputs, and we need to. Um, and we, we signed them so we know like you know no one else is cheating us, but we need to get them back to the coordinator. The problem is if I just post this again, the like my output with the blinded signature, well, I have an IP address and it's just like, well, the same IP address connected to me. So now you're screwed. It's just like, well, it's not the exact same message, but we can see the front the IP addresses and stuff like that as the same person and link them. So, does anyone know how to blind an IP address? Okay, none of you are spooks. Um, <laughs> so you can use Tor. Uh, the Tor sucks, it's very unreliable. You can also use Noster as like a proxy. Um, that's a solution. You could all use the same VPN, but it's not, that's hard. Um, but these are probably the two best ways to do it is Tor and Noster. Um, Everything today mostly uses Tor. Um, there's that guy like 14 million bytes who has a proof of concept with Noster. But uh, so yeah, so basically what we're gonna do now that we have the signed output from the coordinator over, let's, let's use Tor, because that's what most people use. Over Tor, we're gonna send our, um, so we have that, that blinded signature and in, in our output. So now, when we talk to the coordinator, it's going to see, OK, the signature comes from me. It's very valid. Um, you know, it's, so, it's not someone cheating. It's one of these Alice's that registered inputs. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a valid signature. And they have this output that's uh, now like you know, clear in the open. So um, if the signature is valid, then they can, uh, they can add it here. God, I can't spell. So now we have all these outputs here. And uh, that's most of the transaction. Um, so now we have these inputs and outputs. And like the transaction is quote unquote constructed, but we still need to sign it. Um, but does that, that make sense to everyone how we got here? Yeah, it's just like not reliable. No, so Mulvad doesn't really solve it because, you know, if, say, like, this person is using Mulvad, and, like, say they're all using Mulvad, 
but this person is using like the US like a uh, server this one's using like UK and this one's using like I don't know, Spain it's like okay well this person like they could still have all like different IP addresses so that wouldn't solve the problem so normally you use Tor where it's like completely anonymous in that regard or or pretty good or another solution is Noster where you, they're just like basically like looking up in a relay so like the the Noster relay would have the IP addresses but they're like just generic events so you can't tell what's going on um, you know as long as and as long as the coordinator doesn't know the doesn't run the relay then you should be safe yeah it needs to be something where like everyone looks completely uniform and the coordinator can be anyone normally it's like you know like wasabi in the wasabi wallet wasabi is the coordinator and samurai samurai is the coordinator um, but at the end of the day normally these are open source software so everyone can run it and it's just basically like Alice all these Alice's just opt in to like okay I sign up to use this coordinator and they talk to them and uh, hopefully people show up kind of thing um, so normally these are like you know kind of big network effect kind of things Yeah, yeah. So um, normally, like right today, it's more like off chain kind of stuff, which is or like you know just like you know on Twitter or something. But um, something in uh, Vortex, the like coin join POC I made, we like uh, we made it so coordinators were like uh, broadcast through Noster, so you could like look up a Noster event and be like, okay, these are all the coordinators that uh, people have talked about, so you could find them that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, nothing like actually made. I mean, I made it, but no one uses it because I, cause I killed it because uh, it doesn't really work yet. Um, I can answer that for other reasons, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it is it is theoretically solvable. It's just no one's really done it yet. Um, why don't you need to blind your inputs? Like, couldn't that be if like, your coordinator is a spoon, they could be doing chain analysis? And they could at least know who's in the round. Of course, that's where like having a larger anonymity set comes in. Right? Is that kind of a risk? Yeah, good question. So yeah, when we when we registered those inputs, let's go back to that first message. So that first message had um, we had a blinded output and these inputs. So the reason we don't blind these inputs is basically because if they're blinded, then I can come in and be like, here's my inputs, but they're actually fake inputs. They're like, you know, not real UTXOs or UTXOs that have already been spent. So then when the coordinator gives me the um, the blinded signature and I register an output, when and then say this comes unblinded, now I have the inputs in there, now the transaction is invalid. So it's basically like you need a way to like, Kind of have quote unquote skin in the game here of not letting these people like uh, just register and just like stop the round. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, kind of a problem here is that like if Alice has, or say this Alice one has like two inputs, um, now you know th that would both be listed here. So the coordinator could see like okay, these two are owned by Alice. So that is a problem, um, yeah. And then we have seen like you know like Wasabi is doing chain analysis on these inputs. Um, normally, it's you know at the end of the day like this is going on chain. You'll most likely these are this is already a known pair. Um, at least that's the assumption. But uh, it is a problem. So I mean, there's kind of no way around it because otherwise you could you like you can't you'd have to be able to give like a zero knowledge proof that I own Bitcoin. That hasn't been spent that the coordinator can verify and I mean maybe you can, but no one's really invented that kind of stuff yet or uses it. And this is where extra rounds would come in as well, because like even if I am the coordinator trying to like identify the inputs, if they go through five rounds, like the first round I have, you know yeah. like some kind of probability and that probability like squares each next round. Exactly. So yeah, like uh, like Alice has these two inputs here, and then afterwards she'll have like an output and a change. 
if she just keeps mixing this output, then it's going to be like, okay, harder and harder to tell which one exactly is her. Um, yeah, good question there. Uh, so yeah, we have to validate these inputs. So yeah, this court, like I guess I should talk about that. When this coordinator gets this message, they need to validate actually a whole lot to make sure these Alice's aren't, basically aren't trying to denial of service attack this um, round. So like, because imagine like instead of like, you know, we have Alice one, two, and three, and imagine we have CIA right here, who's like, I hate coin joins. Um, we need to stop this. So if they come in and they give me you know, just like fake inputs. Um, then, you know, then the, the, this transaction won't be valid, and you know, we can't broadcast it. No one gets like you know, the benefits of this coin join, so that's not good. So, um, normally in the implementations, like if they send me fake inputs, I just like cut the connection for them. Like, screw you, you're not, you can't do that. Um, but and they can always just reconnect and stuff. But yeah, but they, they won't let them into the rounds. But we can, uh, how, how do they know? Um, so normally the coordinator is just like running a full node and just looks up like on the blockchain uh, of just like, blockchain. yeah, yeah. So these are just like, you know, these are just like, you know, inputs in the transaction. So they're just like, I own Bitcoin at, you know, at this address and this address. And it's like, okay, it looks like you do. And uh, so yeah, normally in those inputs, you give like a, a signature, like prove that you own it, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so you basically just need to prove you own some Bitcoin that can be spent right now, and the coordinator will check that and be like, okay, it's valid. Well, who's coordinator? And the coordinator can be anyone. Normally it's like a centralized service, like the wallet developer or something, or a company. Um, but it can be just like a, a random. Well, yeah, you just said Wasabi does announce that. We don't yeah. Yeah, I mean the thing is the the kind of the goal of this is to be able to not have to trust the coordinator here. Um, so like you know they can even if this coordinator is doing chain analysis, even if it is like the CIA, the ways it's trying to be constructed is that you don't need to trust them. Um, so yeah, like I said, the the main information they're gaining here is um, this this first inputs field of uh, that like here where Alice is linking these two inputs together by saying I own these two. And you know they could do chain analysis on it, but like at the end of the day, the transaction is going to be broadcast on chain and you know everyone can chain analysis at, um, too. So uh, normally the chain analysis is more just like you know to like censor people where like if this Alice came in with money that she withdrew from a dark net market, and then Coinbase, or and then the coordinator to chain analysis, and it's like, oh, th those are you know, quote unquote bad coins. We can block it. So that's a problem. But at the end of the day, like, they're not able to. The coordinator is not going to be able to steal your money. They're not going to be able to, um, like, undo this coin join by like, uh, like you know, by linking these inputs and outputs because of how we're constructing this with the blind signatures. All they're going to be able to do is censor based off that, uh, off of that uh, chain analysis. So you know, it is a problem, but. Um, you know, if they start censoring you, then go to someone else. Uh, that's the hope, at least. But, uh, yeah. Uh, on the topic of coordinators, I know that, like, I think Sparrow is, is running their own coordinator for the Whirlpool. I don't, I think, no, I think they're using the, the main one. They're using, so they're using, say, coordinator. They just like, take the fees and allow you to. Yeah, I think, like, they have, like, an agreement with them or something. Did you have, like, I know that. Uh, Whirlpool, they just released like a Rust implementation library. Yeah. Like seemingly, could you have a, like a coordinator pool or something like that where I don't really trust any one of these coordinators, but they're all running the same like coordination software. So like maybe like house between them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so mo at least, yeah, most of the software you're able to like change in the configuration which coordinator you use. So like, at the end of the day, like, I mean, it's kind of sad to see with Wasabi that they're the only coordinator, like, but um, for their software. But in theory, someone else could run like the Wasabi coordinator, but like, screw you, I'm using someone else. And like, the software could be built in a way where like you have like fallback ones if this one starts blocking you. Um, the thing is, like, current ones, like you know, they don't really have the incentive to. They want you to use their coordinator because they get the money and stuff. But um, you know, hopefully, someone builds it in the better way. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, 
Um, I mean, you don't need to do this part over Noster. Um, it would be good to, though. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably what you would do is just like generate an ephemeral pub key, um, like send, send this. Um, no, for this whole message, you would do it because um, the inputs need to add up to like this output amount we're doing. So, like, if this is a one Bitcoin round, but I only have, like, say, like, Alice only has like 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 Bitcoin. Like, she can't just register one, because if I say, like, here's 0. 0.6 Bitcoin, we're going to be like, well, that's not, that doesn't equal one, so, you know, you don't have enough money to do this, sorry. So you need to register both to be able to do it. Um, so you have to give them both at the same time, but yeah, like, if this was, like, over Noster, you'd probably generate an ephemeral key and then send this over an encrypted DM. Yeah, but I mean that wouldn't be a huge deal. Um, like these keys, like you know, you can throw them away after the round is done and stuff. All right. Um, so yeah, so let's go back to the output registration. Um, so yeah, we authenticated this Alice. We made sure that um, she has valid inputs. Gave her a blind signature saying, okay, you have registered, but um, you know, we don't want you to like be cheating me or someone else to cheat us. So, you know, here's your authentication. Now Alice came back and she gave this uh, she gave a blind sig and an output. So the coordinator takes this these blind sigs and like checks them. And then if it's good, adds it to the transaction. And, um, and that's mostly it. They need to do some authentication on these outputs, like making sure that, uh, like, so like say, like if you gave me like a legacy address, that like, but this, but all these should be taproot, you know, that'd be bad. So, um, or if you gave me like just, what well, if you just sent me junk and not a real address, that, you know, cause you're just trying to stop around, that'd also be bad. So if anything like is wrong with this output here, what we do is we we ban these these um, inputs. So like say Alice one, or actually no, because we don't know who gave us the input, so we don't we can't ban them. So we what we do is actually called a blame round. Um, so if the in this case, basically, wait, is that here? Yeah, yeah. So wait. I can't remember how this works. This is the complicated part. We'll, we'll, we'll do this at the end. This uh, not important yet. But yeah, so I'm um, sorry. So we created this transaction with these outputs. We have these inputs. We need to sign a transaction. So and this is the easy part. You just basically send it back to the original Alice's. And you say, uh, please sign with like a PSBT. Um, so this part is easier to, to do the blame. Um, so we just, I mean, it's just a PSBT, PSBT. Um, so like coordinator sends it to Alice and then she'll send back a uh, assigned PSBT. And um, so the, or the coordinator needs to validate that this, this PSBT, um, so First, Alice need, or the coordinator needs to validate, like, okay, Alice actually signed these things. And um, if Alice gave an invalid signature, okay, well, now she's trying to, like, stop this thing, or she just never signs. Or um, if you came to BitDevs last night, we talked about how you can um, kind of steal fees by, uh, you know, say, like, Alice said, oh, I'm going to spend this, and it's just, like, a normal taproot input. But it turns out it was a taproot input with, like, a huge script. So now it's going to make the transaction bigger. Um, that'd be bad as well. So the coordinator needs to validate, like basically that like Alice is honest and said that these were her inputs and she actually signed them in the station the way she would uh, said she would. And um, if anything is you know not correct there, then basically you know this transaction is not going to be valid. Alice is not going to comply and sign this. So basically we need to go back and um, basically just ban this Alice. And be like, okay, you're trying to stop this round. You're a bad actor. You know, get out of my coin joint. <laughs> so, um, 
So basically, like, the coordinator will add to like its database of like, okay, these inputs are banned. So now, like, if Alice wants to come back, she'll get, like normally it's like for you know a certain duration because you know if like your internet connection drops or something, you don't want to be forever banned. But you know it's like you're banned for the next week. So now Alice will need to like uh, either like spend money on chain to like create new inputs or um, just wait. So you're able to like kind of stop these uh, denial of service attackers. Does that make sense? I see nodding. Um, yeah, but in the happy path, Alice is a good guy, and uh, my five, Alice. okay. So in the happy path, Alice actually signs all of our Alice is signed, and then basically in that case, it's mostly done. Um, if we have these signed PSPTs. Then we can just like you know use that to create a transaction, like a valid transaction. We broadcast it to the network. Maybe we send it back to the Alice's so they can have it too, but they should see it in their mempool. Um, that's the most of it there. Uh, trying to think what else do we have here? I don't know. Does that part make sense? Sign a transaction. I see a hand. It's all concurrently here, so yeah, we won't like. I guess like, would there be a benefit? I don't think so. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's it's, yeah, you, you just do it all concurrently. We don't need to go like, okay, Alice one, you sign. Alice two, you sign. Um, that would just take a while, and uh, I don't know if there's any privacy implications there. I don't think so. I guess maybe yeah, if you did it like concurrently, then um, you know like, Alice three would be like, oh, okay, like these guys are bad or something, or no, like, you know, how many people are in the round. Um, yeah, there's no real reason to do that. All right. Well, let's do some more. So um, let's talk about lightning. So well, with all that stuff, what if instead Um, said I wanted to open a lightning channel inside of this coin join. Um, so I guess, so there's a lot of reasons, so obviously like there's a lot of reasons to open a lightning channel. Um, but one of the cool things is lightning channel is something that's shared. So, um, so like, like we were talking about, like we want all these outputs to be uniform. We're gonna have like you know this is gonna be one bitcoin this is gonna be one bitcoin like all of these are gonna look like the same like you know thing but and in, in like the case we just talked about the user is sending to themselves so we just go okay like you know alice owns one of these and she owns one bitcoin which is cool but like we could do better because like you know we're just like all we're doing is basically you know alice had that 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 here so we, and so we just know, okay, she like she paid 0.1 Bitcoin in fees, and she has one Bitcoin here somewhere. I don't know where, but um, what would be better is like, what if, what if this was Alice's output, but actually it was, um, you know, 0 0.6 to her, and you know, 0 0.4 to like, you know. Um, let's do this. So Bob, and then Bob also opened the channel to her of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, Bob, Alice. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that, but yeah, so like, instead of like Alice getting one of these Bitcoin outputs, what if she opened some lightning channels and, um, now she had shared ownership of some of them. So this way, now it looks like, you know, someone is receiving one Bitcoin, but it's actually two people receiving some, like, you know, a smaller amount of Bitcoin in these. So now, like, when a payment happens, you know, if there's a lightning channel, they can't see it, but when the lightning channel is eventually closed, it gets even harder to tell, like, where the money's going to, because, 
know, maybe it, maybe this is now enclosed at like 0.1 and 0.9. So, you know, it's hard to tell exactly like what happened here. It's not a payment, it's like a lighting channel. Does that make sense? So it's better to use light for sure. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, coin joins are great, and then you can enhance coin joins with lightning, I'm kind of saying here. Um, it's all theoretical for now, but yeah. So, problem is, there's a lot of, you know, lightning's very interactive, so there's some hard problems here. Um, so when we, when we were registering inputs and outputs, um, remember at the beginning, so we had this, we had our inputs, and we had our blinded output. But um, with the lighting channel, I can't just like generate this in my wallet and be like, here's my address. With the lighting channel, Alice and Bob here need to like come together and be like, this is our lighting channel. So um, basically, you kind of just need to delay all of this um, for a little bit. So basically, how this is going to work is um, so instead of like at uh, how do we do this? So yeah. So basically, these Alice's are going to have to like be running two things: this coordinator and be like having their like you know lighting node. And they'll coordinate together. Um, you know, they'll be like, okay, the coordinator will have to tell them time to register. And they'll go out here and be like, okay, hey, Bob, let's open a channel. And uh, they'll then they'll get their blinded output here. And this, like, in theory, it sounds easy, but um, none of the current implementations support this, basically, just because of different timing things. Uh, so like basically like when we construct this this address in Lightning, you only have ten minutes of time to send money to it. Otherwise, like say if it comes in eleven minutes, then Bob's gonna be like, oh, I, I stopped looking at that, and the the money is like kind of locked there, and it's gonna be hard to get to. Um, like it won't be a channel. So um, basically, like our coordinator needs to be aware of like this timing. These Alice's need to be especially aware because they don't want to trust this coordinator. Um, so I mean, it's basically just gonna be uh, once we construct this, we're now like on a clock of like, okay, we can't, you know, screw this. Is it? I thought it was all of them. Really? Yes. Today I learned. <laughs> all right. Well, fuck L and D. Well, if you're opening to an L&D channel, you need to be very aware of this. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's mostly just timing stuff, but um, the, also the, another hard part is basically, uh, if you want to do this multi-channel stuff. Now, uh, basically, Alice and Bob need to, like, Alice needs to make sure both of these channels are in here. And uh, so, she, like, when she's coming to sign, she's the, uh, Verify that like not just her own and here's in there and um, makes you like also making sure that like you know it's not a channel where it's all on Bob's side or you know all on Alice's side stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I think that's mostly on the lighting side. Does that make sense to people? I see some nodding. Um, I don't know. So anything else, coin join stuff people want to go over? Yeah. You mentioned the coordinator fees. Like what's the standard amount for coin join or what to expect from um, the standard transaction fees or more? Yeah, definitely more. So yeah, you you have to pay minor fees. Um, and then you also normally need to pay this coordinator fee. Normally they're around like half a percent to one percent from my recollection. So it's kind of expensive, but um I mean, a lot of the research has gone into like you know if you actually want to protect against these like state actors, it needs to be like fairly high. Um, but like I said, kind of earlier, like it'd be cool if these coordinator fees weren't actually just going straight to the coordinator, but it's going to like a charity or something. It's like okay, well, at least I'm donating to open source funding and stuff. But yeah. What about the Sunday channel? 
I mean, that's what this kind of is, right? I guess, so yeah, if you want to use like interactive TX. Yeah, so I guess we could, so yeah, I'll talk about that. So interactive TX, field funded splicing, super cool, and Kalisa for inventing. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of interactive TX is you have Alice and Bob. Um, if they don't have a channel in the dual funding case or in the splicing case, they do have a channel. And they basically say like, yo, let's open the channel or whatever. And they basically just say like, like here's an input, here's an input, here's an output. And uh, Bob does a similar thing. I guess it's not. It's so they they're like registering these outputs, but shoot, I did this too big. Um, but if Bob Bob can be talking to Carol here. So he also has a channel with, and if Carol's like, hey, I want to get in on this transaction, she can be like, okay, here's my inputs. Uh, let's just write inputs. Input, input. So she can register this, and then Bob, uh, and then Bob will be like, okay, cool. And he'll just register these as well, like into here. And uh, and Alice won't know if these are Bob's or Carol's inputs, so um, you can use it as like a decentralized transaction coordination mechanism. Uh, the the only problem here is we're not using the uh, the blind signature kind of schema we were using in the coin join coordination. So like, if say like in this case, if like Bob is knowing everyone here, so if Bob is a spook, he's gonna know, okay, these are Alice's or these are Carol's and these are Alice's. But um what do you mean? Oh, so like instead of Alice here, we have like you have like coordinator and like off like you know down here we're doing like the blind six stuff and then so the coordinator trans constructing the transaction it just constructs like and like it creates like the messages right yeah yes that would work Lisa, would that work? Uh, I mean, the solution basically gets us right now is like Alice starts opening a bunch of channels with a bunch of people. So it's like basically it's the way you can do dynamic coordinators. So like I can basically coordinate a multi channel open with like four or five different people. I get them all to put different input into it and I just would kind of collect them and send out all the information back to everyone else. So everyone builds a copy of the transaction independently and then signatures for it and there's a um, part of the spectrum what order you sign it so it's really a protocol for building transactions with like groups of people without a central coordinator kind of um but you could have like one person that's also really well, it's, it's really flexible like one person could do the central coordinator and you have a couple people that are like doing stuff and adding different stuff to it um i guess like like I guess like what, what I was trying to solve here with the coordinator is like the uh, like what if Alice is a spook and is like logging everything like like this person registered this so like we can still do the blind signature magic to like hide from them. I mean, but for like if, if Bob is sending Alice like if the coordinator is a spook, um, yeah, Alice wouldn't know what of the stuff that Bob sends her is from Bob itself mm -hmm. or what if it's from Carol, right? So. 
there's a certain amount of plausible deniability in this fact as to who the inputs that you receive from a peer yeah. directly belong to. Like, it doesn't really belong to Bob's all, right? It could yeah. just be all Carol's. It could be yeah. all Carol's, but Bob's like passing it over to the coordinator. So, yeah. Yeah, I am. And and a Claire and almost. A Claire's almost, yeah. We just got interrupt working, I think, like last Monday. He about to finish the test, so like the next version of four lightning will be working. We'll work with like the third version. And someone's working on it on both LND and LDK. I know Jeff's working on it for LD, LDK. Yeah. And they told me in like 0 0.15, which is like two or three months away, so let's go. Um, so you could use this for coin join mechanism. Uh, no one does that yet, but in theory. Um, I know. Well, That's fair. I, I guess there's no known software people like doing it specifically for privacy reasons. They're just using like dual funded channels. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, uh, we can stop there unless anyone else has something else they want to cover. Oh, go ahead first. Well, I just had, uh, I was looking up Jam. Yeah. First Jam fit in all this. So, yeah, so that's Join Market. <laughs> they work a little differently. So is it a version of CoinJoin or? Yes, yes. So it's like a version of CoinJoin, like about the kind of the first way we talked about it. Um, and, and while you think of it, it's like, you know, um, a lot of us may have acquired through KYC um, before. Is there a way to use CoinJoin to eliminate that trail? <laughs> so, I mean, like, like, if you want on Coinbase, like, Coinbase will always know that. And, like, you know, they've, they've probably told the government already. But, uh, it's like uh, it kind of said at the beginning, like you have Coinbase here, and they sent funds to you, and like that's this link will always exist here. But like what you're trying to do is like basically like all future stuff yeah. you were you're trying to hide here. So like if you like you know if you just go buy coffee but you don't want them to know you bought coffee, that's gonna help that. Or you know if you go do something that Coinbase doesn't want you to do, you can hide from that and they're not going to like report you. You could also just sell the Bitcoin on Coinbase so that they have a record of you having sold it and then go acquire it on a deck or something. Yeah. And then, I like that. Yeah, that you're starting. Yeah. Because then you eliminate that initial connection. Yeah. It might be cheaper than Coinbase fees as well, depending on what yeah. you have. Well, it's paying your taxes and. Yeah. And then the dex fees and stuff, but yeah, I know that's the solution. Um, but yeah, yeah. Again, like all these like on-chain privacy tools is kind of solve this problem. Like the KYC stuff is like you know, no amount of Bitcoin tech can solve that. Besides like not buying on Coinbase. Um, but yeah, let's talk about join market. The join market's really cool. Um, basically, their model is. I think uses basically the same protocol, but there's no centralized coordinator. So they have like basically these Tor addresses. Or it used to be uh, IRC channels, but now it's mostly Tor addresses. It used to kind of like a, a list of like, you know, Tor one, Tor two, Tor three, like. Um, so basically, they kind of have these lists of like these people are willing to coin join. Like are they, these are like their addresses, and they're willing to coin join. And then they have some like uh, 
information about them. Like they'd be like, okay, this guy has like a hundred Bitcoin and he charges like, you know, 0.1% or something. And this guy has three Bitcoin and he charges 0.2%. And this guy has, you know, know, four and he charges 1%. Um, And they also do that fidelity bond thing I was talking about too. So they'd be like, this guy has a hundred points, this guy has two points, this guy has uh, 40 points. So you can kind of see like, um, it's kind of like a marketplace of like who I want to coin join with. And then uh, basically like the client comes in and they see all these offers and they're like, okay, who do I want to coin join with? They pick it and they do like a, a coin join with that person. Um, and it's nice because like, uh, like what we were just talking about, like normally the coordinator has a fixed amount of like, okay, these are like one Bitcoin rounds. Versus this is like a marketplace. So, you know, if I'm humble pleb, I might go find like, you know, a 0.05 round or something. Or if I'm Michael Saylor, I might be like, oh, hey, look, there's a hundred Bitcoin round. I'm going to do that. And so you're able to like kind of do like get all the markets. So like by user count, um, Twitter market is way lower, but by volume, it's way higher because they have these like really big amounts. Um, And the nice thing too is like, if anyone can be a coordinator and these coordinators get fees, people kind of use it as like a yield generator where like, you know, they'll put up their Bitcoin, these fees, and you know, over, instead of like, if you don't need the coin join right now, you can just like list it and then over time you'll like do some coin joins and make some sats. And it's, uh, I don't know, when I did it, I didn't make too much, but I hear, I hear other people make some good money on it, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's that's my understanding of join so, market. So, how, so they're making a cut off each of the transactions, and they don't need it themselves. They're just trying to make income off of it. Well, it's like a node operator or something. I mean, a little bit. So like, like this isn't like just like a. I mean, it's a kind of passive thing, but not really. Like, like they need to do this fidelity bond thing I talked about at the beginning, where they need to like lock up like a lot of Bitcoin for an extended extended period of time. They are earning some sats. For doing so, and they are, you know, they are increasing their privacy by doing these coin joins. It's just not like a, uh, you know, like normally the, the people that are coming in and paying for the fee are like, you know, I'm gonna go, you know, do something that Coinbase doesn't want me to do. So then they're gonna they're paying the fee to like do it right now versus like waiting. And um, you know, it's, you know, like if you like need like a lot of rounds like doing this may take like a year versus like just paying for it can happen today so you know it's all of like a timing thing and like you know if you want like extreme high level of privacy you might need to like pay more than just like leaving it and like doing the yield generator Does that make sense yeah it's just you know with chain analysis it makes it a lot harder because they obviously have a lot of tools to inspect like if you're coming from the left to the right in any of these scenarios, they're going to be looking for the like for like swaps. And uh, I can't remember which alternative you brought up, but when you can break that out and you don't have the same going in and going out, or you change like you're receiving and sending, yeah, then that can really screw up the chain analysis because now there's it's very difficult to track. It's just trying to out, outdo the chain analysis is basically what we're all doing here. Yeah, you should watch. Uh, you would definitely enjoy Adam Gibson's talk on CoinJoin XP at Bitcoin Plus Plus. He kind of went over like the future of like all this, and like you know, no one's really built it yet, but of how to do like theoretically, we could do coin joins that just look like payments, but are coin joins. So like the chain analysis be kind of becomes defunct because they're like, well, someone's making payments, but it's actually like doing like real coin join like privacy stuff. So like it really like hurts their like analysis stuff. Yeah, it's like, again, like when you do this transaction that has a hundred inputs and a hundred outputs, like a like, huge coin join, it's the chain analysis is like, well, that guy did a coin join. So it's very obvious what you're doing. Yes. <laughs> so it, it is a problem, but uh, I don't know. For the most part, it's been fine. You, you know, it, and if BlockFi or Binance blocked you from depositing, you probably ended up be- benefiting from that. So maybe, um, <laughs> You know, no one that seriously has like uh, blocked it yet. But yeah. So when he did that talk, like when are we gonna have a default? 
I know. No. Transaction is it's a blessing and a curse with the public blockchain. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's working on it. I don't know. I mean, the talk was when was that? October, December. What about is Block working on it with Dorsey stuff or no? No, there. So there's like TBD is building that like decentralized exchange stuff, but um, that's about it. I don't think they're building any privacy tools. So I guess there's like LEK with um, Lightning stuff, but yeah. So for. I wanted to uh, hear your thoughts on how maybe ordinals could be tied into this. Because when you're trying to sell or transfer an ordinal to someone, you already have like really strange outputs. Trying to like buffer your outputs to try and get a specific ordinal to transfer to yeah. a specific order. And it's also really arbitrary. Like you could essentially like sell an ordinal to yourself and nobody would know what you're doing. So, Wash do you like, have any ideas on like how this, I guess all the traffic being generated by ordinal sales, like could also maybe be used for high point joints? I don't know if you could do that. I mean, so I guess like, so these ordinals, like, you know, you're, tra you're basically sending around dust, but it's like an NFT, so it's not dust. Um, Now, I need to think about that more, but like, yeah, because you're like you're doing. Because normally, like transactions are like broken by like finding like okay, this is the payment, this is the change. But it's ordinals, you're kind of not doing that. I mean, I guess you would just find which one's the inscription or the rare set and figure out what. Then that's the payment. Um, let's say that there's no connotation of it being valuable necessarily. Like you, you're, you're just for whatever reason somebody is trying to sell a Satoshi, and they're also obfuscating the coin joint thing. Whether they're selling it to themselves in like two rounds, or just maybe there are people selling ordinals, but they're also hiding coin joints in there too, because of all these outputs you have to create just to order the Satoshis correctly. So you're talking about like mixing ordinals into coin joins, or mixing coin joins into ordinals? No, like mixing the former. Mix it. I don't know if mixing ordinals in the coin joins would really benefit because, like I said, like, um, I mean, if, if, I guess it would benefit the ordinals people, maybe not the coin join people. But, um, <laughs> so, like, the coin join people, they're coming in with, like, say, like, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. They're getting their one, uh, Bitcoin out here, and a bunch of other people are getting one Bitcoin. Um, so, like, you know, if someone comes in with like, you know, 500 Sats, and then you know, so, and like, say in this one, they get the Sats, and the ordinal goes out. Like, the coin join people didn't benefit from this at all. Like, this output is like, you know, so obviously not part of their coin join that. It's not increasing the privacy. Um, now, I guess this person had less transaction overhead, so maybe they benefit from it. But um, I don't know. It wouldn't really help the privacy or anything. What if you had a you had an ordinal in a UTXO and you had to split it into three because you needed to extract that one ordinal, and then so you have these two outputs which are you know, uniform back to you, and they could be part. Of, you know, so I guess like. I, mean, I guess in theory, maybe like yeah, if you had like if this person had like a, this is wrong. If they had like say like a, a one point five like UTXO, and they're like, okay, well my ordinal's like in a certain spot, so they can create a one bitcoin and then like a, you know, zero point four to get their ordinal, and then like a zero point one. I mean maybe, but like I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, ordinals, like, normally those people aren't going for privacy, so I don't know. It's it's a little hard. Um, I guess something we can talk about, that was a question at BitDevs last night, was like, 
do ordinals hurt privacy or hurt coin joins? So I guess I'll try to show you guys that it doesn't. So like, um, so like traditional transaction models are like, I guess let's, if we can still do a coin join. Um, let's add like a 1.1 and a 2.1. So, these are set, uh, that one, I don't know, like 0.1 fees. So, the traditional way to do this, so, so let's say like these two go to here, this one goes here, and these two go to here. So, if we did this by ordinal theory, that would mean that this person gets this output, this person gets this output, and then this person gets these two. So, um, so people are like saying like, oh, ordinals can hurt privacy, but like it's just like not correct because if you did ordinal theory, this would be already wrong because it would say these two, the, the, this like you know this person here as Alice owns this input, but they actually own this input. And then, you know, they do the next transaction where it does the same thing again, and it's wrong again, and again, and again. You know, maybe it's right a couple times, but, you know, if you're doing that over a long period of time, it's going to be always incorrect, so it's not actually going to track the correct ownership. You like this, this amount analysis is normally the, always the correct way to find who owns what, not the actual ordinal tracking. I don't know. I guess Constantine was in here. Is it in here? He was the one that asked that last night. But what is is it with ordinal theory if the transfer of the inscription to this ownership goes to the first stat, like the first output? So if you're if it's an input in a coin join, the first output is now the owner of it. So you're like there's no way to control like if you're gonna be the recipient of So I mean, so like, yeah, normally, well, normally, I'm not too, I don't know much about ordinals, but. Uh, it, it tracks the input rather than the output. My understanding would be like, like if this was an NFT and this was an NFT, that the first one would go here, because, um, and then, and then, so we have like a whole other Bitcoin to get to, so that would go here. And then the next NFT would go here because um, that's the next like whole Bitcoin that got added up. I guess, yeah, like it would be like, so we have 1.1 in the first input. So the first one would be here. And then the second NFT would be like at the 0.9 Bitcoin of this one Bitcoin. That's my understanding of ordinal theory. Um, I think like when they... Well, so like with ordinal theory, it's like basically like you, you take like the first inputs from the, this and it goes to here and then like say if like if this was like a 0 0.5 to 0 0.1, then like this would go into both of these like. Yeah, yeah, it's that base. So the first stat it goes to this, this you know, the first. 10 million stats goes to here, and the next 5 million stats goes to here. And then this one, you know, the first, um, you know, all, all of this would go into this, like, one Bitcoin output, and then the first 0. 0.6 would go into this one, the next 0. 0.5 would go into this one. I didn't think of it as input first out, so that first out, the first two stats out of this entire coin chain are now owned by both. Well, like all the ordinals are the same. Like, I mean, the inscription could have been done like a, you know, a thousand blocks ago. And we like it's all tied to the to the to the individual sat, not to like it having an inscription. So I th I think you have to follow ordinal theory here and then send it to each, um, the correct one. So when I read the dip on this, this Casey uh, did read the dip. Mm -hmm. When I read it. My understanding was that the inputs of a transaction determine 
essentially the order of the ordinals for that transaction. And then the outputs kind of determine how they're grouped yeah. going into the next input. So you, if you want to transfer an ordinal, you sort of have to use the outputs to rearrange them into the proper order. But those, that order is not recognized until that output becomes an input in another transaction, in a sense. Because like in the in the the way that Casey wrote the software, like it pretty much discards the the, the outputs and only looks at the inputs each time it uh, it indexes a transaction. So it's the inputs into a transaction that sort of like determine the order for that transaction. Uh, and then if you want to like rearrange things so that you have a particular SAT in a particular UTXO. Um, related to the input of that transaction, then you use the outputs to do that determination. Um, that's my understanding of it. And yeah, now I'm more confused. I don't know. Um, it's funny because, like, in the BIP, it's like such a simple thing. Like, it's like, yeah, it's like this little, yeah. yeah. But it's still hard to wrap your mind around. And now we have four megabyte blocks. <laughs> yeah. I don't totally know, but I think, and for one, I know it doesn't hurt privacy, so we can settle on that. But yeah, the NFT stuff, I'm not too sure. Um, what, are you trying to hide your NFTs or what? Like, what's the ordinal? Yeah, for putting ordinals into blocks. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have that set for my own node, but most people don't have that set, and I don't think there's a way to enforce it. No. So, yeah. I a million percent agree with that. But like even besides the coin selection stuff, it's like I gotta realize like if I built this and like, you know, the user could be using it perfectly and then just go into Thunderhub and open a channel and then be screwed. Or even in the worst case, they could like be using it perfectly, do everything through Vortex, and then they need to like bump a channel on their anchor output and it uses random coin selection and screws them. So like you kind of it's hard, so basically kind of realize like the way to get the best on chain privacy is like kind of building it herself inside of Mutiny. So that's the plan now. Um, like LJ has some really nice tools where like like for anchor outputs you can do shit like um, it'll like say like just bump this transaction and like we get to select the UTXOs and like like we kind of just own everything. So that's kind of the goal now is like build into Mutiny instead. Um, Hell yeah. What's your concern with uh, Wasabi's wallet? You mentioned earlier. I mean, I think like their tech is really cool with the handling weight stuff, but um, I mean, they the problem is they they do chain analysis on the coordinator side, which like, I mean, it's not the best obviously, but like, so I think like in that regard, like they're kind of compromised, so I don't want to give them money at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, I mean, it might still be a decent privacy tool, but it's hard. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like, I mean, they're definitely blocking like the sanctioned addresses, but like if you like withdrew from like a dark market and coin joined, they might like, be like, oh, you can't do that and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's, I mean, it's like, I mean, it might still be a fine privacy tool, but you know, they're also posting all of your addresses that you give them to chain analysis. You know, the same people that like Coinbase is working with and stuff. So it's, it's not good. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is that like, it's also not the end of the world. Like, uh, you can take the other side of it and be like, well. You're doing a coin join. It's going to be various on chain that those addresses were doing a coin join. That you're a privacy seeking individual. So like, you know, who cares? But uh, I don't know. I think for me, it's more of like a ethics kind of thing than like a total technical thing. But yeah, I don't know. Wrap it up. All right. Thank you guys.